The American soldier shielded 31-year-old Pauline Thompson from the Melbourne rain. They alternated between sheltering in doorways and braving the rain along Spring Street. May have been a miserable night in Melbourne, but Pauline and her new American friend were laughing the whole time. It was getting towards the middle of May in 1942, and the nights were long and cold, but for the time being, Pauline felt warm in the arms of this baby-faced American boy. Sure, they'd had a few drinks, and in the light of day, she was a wife and mother, but tonight was different. Tonight, she felt like a single girl again, like back in the 30s. So as they turned the corner and began to walk along the dark street, she began to sing softly, a tune that only she and her American friend would hear. Suddenly, she was flung to the ground. That voice! Give me that voice! Give me that voice! Let's take a stab at this. Hi mates, and welcome to Something About Murder. I'm Jay Something, and every week I report on true crime from here in Australia. If that sounds interesting to you, go ahead and shoot the like button with your trusty boomstick, stab that subscribe button until it bleeds, and make sure you also punch the notification bell in the face so you can get notified every time we release a new video. All of our episodes are released at the same time on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. In the winter of 1942, the women of Melbourne were stricken with panic as a serial killer was on the loose. The brownout strangler, as he came to be known, had seemingly no method to his madness and would strike randomly. Every woman out in the dark city night thought to themselves, am I next? Edward Joseph Leonsky was born in December 1917 in Kenville, New Jersey. He was the sixth child of Russian Jewish immigrants John and Amelia Leonsky. His childhood was not a happy one. The house was one of constant abuse tied to alcoholism. As a child, he was regularly beaten viciously, as well as being cruelly tortured by his drunken father. One of his brothers was even committed to a mental institution. Perhaps in response to the constant beatings and cruelty, Edward's mother was very overprotective and controlling of him. This led to him being taunted and bullied by the other children in the neighbourhood as a mama's boy. That being said, Edward was a good child. His sister once said that he was so good it would scare her. As a teenager, he got a job as a delivery boy, but was constantly late to work uh, due to his mother's overprotective nature. And as his teenage years wore on, he started to feel a real sense of resentment towards his mother. So it was a bit of a relief for the 24-year-old Eddie Leonsky to be called up to the United States Army in February 1941. Finally, free of his mother's clutches and his father's drunken abuse, he launched into army life with fervor completing his basic training at Fort Sam Houston in Texas. Another reason that Leonsky signed up was to get away from his brother and sister-in-law. Eddie had fallen in love with her. Back home, and without her Eddie to protect and control, his mother was committed to a mental institution. Senior officers painted the picture of a young man who was a good soldier when he joined the army, but he became increasingly poor one over time. One senior officer claimed that Leonsky was continually in trouble not for nefarious reasons, but more through accidents of his own doing. This happened at the time when he increasingly turned to the use of alcohol. Leonsky was proud of his strength and demonstrated it to all he could. He drank much more than the average soldier, and in a fellow soldier's opinion, he was unable to resist the lure of alcohol. In December 1941, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the United States finally joined World War II. By this time, Australia had already been in the war for two years and with the Japanese making their way through Southeast Asia and bombing Darwin. The Australian government supported the United States making base in Australia so they could help fight off the threat in the Pacific. Eddie Leonsky and his fellow soldiers were summarily shipped down under, a stepping stone to the growing conflict with Japanese forces in the Pacific. Even though the young private was strong and proud of it, often challenging his fellow soldiers to fights, he cried so much leaving Fort Sam Houston that other soldiers had to pack his bags for him. In Melbourne, camps had been set up for American soldiers at the Melbourne Cricket Ground in Richmond, which was called either Camp Murphy or simply the Cricket Grounds, and at Royal Park in Parkville, which was known as Camp Pell. It was at Camp Pell where Private Eddie Leonsky and his fellow soldiers in the 52nd Signal Battalion had their barracks. Eddie was well liked by most that knew him, 
although other soldiers reported that he liked to drink heavily and that when he did, he became aggressive, particularly towards women. The United States sergeant, who had known Leonsky for almost a year, later told media of a visit he made to Luna Park in St Kilda with the young private who had been drinking. And at Luna Park, he grabbed at a number of girls and women and, and tried to kiss them. On another occasion, soldiers remembered him being able to drink more than 30 beers and eight glasses of whiskey in one sitting. He was arrested multiple times for being absent without leave, usually under the influence. In Melbourne, Leonsky worked in the Campbell kitchen, and when he wasn't, he was often found asleep in a drunken state or drinking at one of the local hotels. His work was usually done by about 10.30, so the rest of the day was his own. Colleagues said that his party trick was walking across the bar in his hands, and that when he was blackout drunk, his voice was different, softer than usual. He often wouldn't remember what had happened the night before. During this time, Melbourne was keeping lights low of an evening, similar to London's blackouts. Melbourne, with its deep water port and nationally significant munitions and aircraft construction factories, was feared to be a target for enemy air attacks. So in December 1941, a brownout began to be enforced, dimming the lights of Melbourne and its suburbs. Only one street lamp in four was lit and was shaded as to throw a dim light. Trains had only two thirds of each carriage lit, while city and suburban stations had their ordinary lighting dimmed at least 50%. Headlights on most Melbourne trams were fitted with hoods. The darkness increased traffic accidents and public transport delays, and Melbourne paper The Argus observed that there had never been more people going about Melbourne with broken arms and sprained ankles. Shops began closing at 6pm. In the half-light, pubs, cinemas and cafes did a roaring trade. Dance halls were one of the few opportunities for men and women to mingle. Behind the fun, however, the dim light cast an ominous shadow the brownout strangler was lurking. Ivy McLeod was a 40-year-old woman who lived on Victoria Parade in East Melbourne. She was on a mission to reinvent herself after separating from her husband. She was at the time working as a lady's help. Previously, Ivy had worked as a hostess in a cafe. On the 2nd of May 1942, Ivy left her home to go to her boyfriend John Thompson's house in Albert Park at around 11pm. The two talked about plans to move away together and start fresh in New South Wales. They'd both recently divorced and wanted to start again. Finishing up at around 2am, John offered to escort her to the Victoria Avenue all-night tram stop, but Ivy told him that she didn't need to be escorted, and then she left on her own, dressed in black with a blue scarf. Harold Gibson, a nearby resident, was walking over to hose down the front of the Bleak House Hotel in the early hours of the 3rd when he spotted a man dressed in a United States military uniform standing in the doorway of a shop at 191 Victoria Avenue. When he went over to see what the man was looking at, the soldier hurried away on nearby Beaconsfield Parade. Gibson found a woman lying in the doorway, and at first glance Harold thought the woman might be drunk and asleep and began to walk past. But suspicion got the better of him and he got down onto his haunches and he lit a match to get a better view of the woman. The extra light allowed him to see that the woman was partially clothed, the only indication that she'd ever worn a dress being the belt of one wrapped around her waist. Her legs were folded under her and she was badly battered. Carefully, Gibson reached out and touched her, but there seemed to be no reaction to his touch and he couldn't detect any signs that she was breathing. Unable to do anything else for the woman, and incapable of chasing after the man he'd also seen in the doorway, Harold did the only thing that could be done and called the police from a nearby phone box. Police arrived soon after, and investigations quickly began, as officers spoke with neighbours and occupants of the local Bleak House Hotel, hoping someone had heard or seen something. Meanwhile, back at the crime scene, the woman was identified as Ivy McLeod, and robbery was ruled out as a motive, as her purse was found with her body still full of money. There was also no physical evidence of a sexual assault, and with no witnesses to the attack, the police began to believe that the attacker had silenced her in some way, either by smothering her screams or by knocking her out. The cause of death was given as a skull fracture, but investigators also found evidence of strangulation. Pauline Thompson had moved down to Melbourne at the end of April 1942 from Bendigo for work. She was employed as a typist during the day at the International Harvester Company, and on the switchboard in the evening for Melbourne radio station 3AW. Married to a Bendigo police officer and a mother of two, she made the hard decision to follow her career down to Melbourne, leaving the children behind with her husband and family. This was a very common thing at the time, and there was a lot of work available in the city. 
She'd moved into the Morningside house, boarding house, and had made a few new friends. So after having had a visit from her husband and children the night before, she was excited to go out on the town for a dance and a few drinks on Friday 8th of May. The plan was to all meet up at the American Hospitality Club at 7pm. When the American private they were going to meet didn't turn up, the small group of women decided to move on to their next destination, the Music Lovers Club, where they danced up a storm and had a good few drinks. The rest of the group called it quits after the dance had ended, but Pauline wasn't ready for the night to stop, so she went to the Astoria Hotel, where she caught the eye of a baby-faced American GI. Together they drank gin and talked for a few hours. Pauline told the American soldier about her love of singing and even sang a few bars to him. She was then seen leaving with the soldier around midnight. In the early hours of Saturday morning, at about 4.15am, night watchman Henry McGowan was doing his rounds on Spring Street when he found a discarded handbag. Not thinking too much of it, he put it in a visible safe place and continued with his morning, figuring that whoever owned it would come back for it. Coming back around the same way about an hour later with a little more of the early morning light, he found way more than a discarded handbag. Laying on her back with her arms and legs outstretched on the steps of the Morningside house was the dead body of Pauline Thompson. Her dress had been pushed over her shoulders and down to her waist in the same way as Ivy McLeod. She was missing her right shoe, her coat was found under her legs and her hat was under her foot. The beaded necklace she had been wearing was broken, the beads spilled all over the steps. Henry McGowan quickly called for police and a passing patrol car was stopped immediately. The post-mortem showed eerie similarities between Pauline and Ivy McLeod's murders. The coroner ruled that Pauline had been killed three to four hours before her body was discovered and the cause of death was found to be strangulation. Pauline Thompson's body showed the same marks of a beating as Ivy McLeod, along with bruising on her neck and side. As a result of their preliminary investigations, police determined that the two murders were likely to be connected. Both women were found in a similar state of undress after being beaten by their attacker and strangled. Both women still had their handbag without any obvious signs of thievery. And then there was the third link. There had been the sighting of a US soldier being near the crime scene or with the victim before both of their deaths. The media connected the dots immediately and sensationalist reports followed. Women of Melbourne were terrified and the general feeling about the Americans in the city had begun to change. Gladys Hosking was fairly nervous about walking home alone in the Melbourne brownout. At five feet tall, she felt that she was a prime target for the man who was attacking women randomly in Melbourne. She wrote to her father in Perth that she hardly ever went out at night, but said that if someone was with her, she would go, but never alone. Hosking was refined, well-traveled, and had a talent for writing. On the 18th of May, a rainy Monday evening, Gladys finished her day's work at the Chemistry School of the Melbourne University Library, where she was employed as a secretary to the school in the lubricants and bearings section. She had worked later than usual in the evening, finishing an exam paper for the next day with her friend and colleague, Dorothy Pettigrew. They left the chemistry school at approximately 6.30 p.m. and walked a short way from Melbourne University in the rain. A baby-faced American soldier offered to shelter her under his umbrella, and at the Royal Parade tram stop, Dorothy said her goodbyes to her friend Gladys and watched the two walk away. The last anyone saw of Gladys Hosking was walking up Royal Parade sharing an umbrella with an American soldier. Private Noel Seymour was fairly new to the Australian Army. A cadet, he'd been given the task of guarding some Army vehicles on the night of Monday 18th of May. Through the rain, Seymour spotted an American soldier covered in mud. Concerned, Noel gave the man a cursory greeting, and as the American walked over to him, Seymour asked if the man was okay. The soldier asked how to catch the tram to Camp Pell. Curious as to why he was covered in mud, the American soldier told Noel that he'd slipped while walking. Throughout their conversation, the American mentioned he was living in Area 1 at Camp Pell. He thanked the private for his directions and went on his way. At approximately 7am the next morning as the sun was rising, Butcher Albert Whiteway was driving his horse lorry north along Gatehouse Street, Parkville, and noticed an umbrella on the grass. Inside the fence, he saw on the clay bank what appeared to be a human body. After summoning an Australian soldier he saw some distance away, they went over the fence and found the body of a woman lying face down in the mud with her bottom and thighs bare. The clothing and naked body was smeared with mud. The Australian soldier contacted the police who arrived within the half hour. CIB detectives identified the body of Gladys Hosking 
along with her handbag, an umbrella and a hat two blocks from her home. Similar to the other murders, there was nothing missing from her handbag and the state in which her body was found, beaten and strangled with the dress pulled down to the waist and legs akimbo, was very familiar. As police searched the area, they found their first physical clue in these cases. Not far away from the body of Gladys Hosking, a US issue military singlet with the initials EJL printed on it was found. In the soapy mud, footprints were also found. The media jumped on this clue with fervor. USGI terrorizes women, screamed the headlines. Many outlets have been against letting Americans have their base in Melbourne, calling the GIs overpaid, oversexed and over here. And they stoked the flames of discontent with daily fear-mongering updates on the serial killer who they named the Brownout Strangler. And now that it was public knowledge that an American serviceman was most likely involved, the police started to receive reports of other women being attacked. In one incident, the attacker entered the flat of a woman but was distracted by a person outside and ran away when the woman screamed. In another incident, an American GI had followed a woman home from the tram and just as she went to open the front door, he grabbed her. The woman's uncle luckily opened the door, confronted the attacker and threw a chair at him before the soldier escaped. Both people managed to get a good look at the baby-faced attacker. By now, American military police were also informed that the suspect was very likely a member of their ranks. The unit that was connected to the United States camps cooperated fully with Victoria Police, and 15,000 servicemen at Camp Pell were lined up on the 20th of May for witnesses to try and identify. These witnesses included Dorothy Pettigrew, Private Noel Seymour, Harold Gibson, and one Mr. Jackson, the uncle who threw the chair at his niece's attacker. As the servicemen walked past the witnesses, there was no sound. Nobody seemed to have had a good enough view of the attacker. Victoria police and military police were despondent and military police dismissed the units. Suddenly a voice yelled out in the darkness, that's him, that's the man. Eyes turned towards Mr. Jackson, who was pointing at a baby faced serviceman identified as 24 year old private Edward Leonsky of the 52nd Signal Battalion. The man turned to run, but was summarily stopped by his fellow soldiers. Private Noel Seymour also identified Leonsky later on and also confirmed that this was the man who he'd met on the night of Gladys Hosking's murder. Leonsky's tent was searched and muddy clothing was found with traces of blood on them, as well as a muddy scrubbing brush and some muddy newspapers, including one reporting the murder of Ivy McLeod. Taken to a private officer's tent at Camp Pell, Leonsky was read his rights by CIB Detective Sergeant McGuffin who was present in the room with a Detective Murray, as well as US Army representatives, Lieutenant Johnson and Sergeant Zorfas. Leonsky summarily identified the items that were taken from his tent and questioning began. Asked for his whereabouts on the night of Gladys Hosking's murder, Leonsky related that he'd been drinking at the Parkville Hotel and gone back to a man's house for a few more drinks before going to the cinema. He'd abruptly left the man's house and then couldn't remember anything further about the evening. The detectives warned Leonsky that even if he was drunk, he was still responsible for his actions, and he was then reminded of his rights. It was at this point that Eddie Leonsky revealed that he'd told another soldier, Private Gallo, that he had committed the murders. Questioning was then paused so that detectives and army representatives could take a statement from Private Gallo. The next morning, US Army Captain Service, along with Lieutenant Johnson and Detective Adams, resumed questioning, this time with a sworn statement from Gallo stating that Leonsky had told him that he'd committed the murders and that Gallo was having a moral crisis as to whether to turn Leonsky in. Captain Service told Leonsky that he'd been identified by an Australian soldier at the Camp Pell lineup two nights before. Leonsky asked Service what was gonna happen now and Service told him that he was likely to be court-martialed. The two had further conversations about Leonsky's past life and then, out of the blue, Eddie Leonsky described what had happened to Gladys Hosking. He said that he'd been drinking in Parkville Hotel until 6.30pm, had gone to someone's house and then left. He then met a very small woman and accompanied her, sheltering her with an umbrella. As they arrived at her house, he asked her to show him the way to Camp Pell, which she did. When they came to a dark part of Gatehouse Street, Gladys pointed at the nearby barracks and turned to leave. He told the captain that she had a fascinating voice, a lovely voice, and he wanted it. Leonsky grabbed her by the throat and carried her over the fence where she was found falling as he did so. Gladys was making gurgling sounds, so to stop her, Leonsky put her dress in her mouth to stop the sounds, and once they stopped, he became frightened and ran away. 
After running away, he ran into Private Seymour and pretended to not know where he was going. The captain had written down Eddie's words and read it back to him. Leonsky confirmed that that is what he had said, essentially turning this discussion with Captain Service into a confession to the murder of Gladys Hosking. Service's written notes were then typed up and Eddie Leonsky signed his confession. Whilst this was happening, Lieutenant Johnson stayed in the room. Out of the blue, Leonsky again began recalling one of the murders, this time of Pauline Thompson. He said that he now remembered about the girl who was killed in Spring Street, that he met her in a restaurant when she was waiting for an order. He asked her if he could sit with her and eventually they went to a pub called the Astoria. There they talked and Pauline told him that she liked to sing. They were looking into each other's eyes and she was singing in Eddie's ear and he felt like she was just singing to him. Leonsky said that when they left the hotel, they walked a little more and that Pauline had a nice voice. She sang as they walked along. Then when they turned a corner and found nobody around, Leonsky grabbed her. He said he didn't know why. He grabbed her around the neck. He wanted her to keep singing and she stopped singing. Eddie said that he was afraid after that had happened and wanted to get back to camp, but he'd spent all his money at the Astoria. So he stole around two pounds from Pauline's bag, hailed a taxi and left. This statement was taken down by Lieutenant Johnson and again it was typed up and the confession was signed by Leonsky. By this time, Leonsky was ready to reveal all. Detective Adams asked him about the girl in Albert Park, Ivy McLeod, and Leonsky said that he'd been drinking at the Bleak House Hotel with a girl called Pat and another soldier. They'd left the pub after hours and gone across to the beach and sat against a wall still drinking. Leonsky and Pat kissed a few times and then Pat and the other soldier got onto a tram at the all-night tram stop. Leonsky decided not to take the tram but ended up standing against a wall thinking about his mother and his home. He was feeling lonely. He thought about the six Australian civilians who had jumped him and beaten him up recently. That's all, just thinking about stuff. The interview was ended at this time and Leonsky was taken to the city watch house. The next day, questioning continued and so did Leonsky's confession. After he'd sat and felt his feelings for a while, Eddie decided to walk up the street and he saw a girl in a shop doorway. Eddie made a comment about liking her bag and took the bag and felt it. It was soft and Leonsky liked it a lot. Ivy McLeod walked back into the doorway and Leonsky grabbed her around the neck. She fell quickly and they both hit the wall as they were falling. He started to rip at her clothes but couldn't undo her belt. He became obsessed with tearing the belt but heard footsteps coming and ran off. This statement didn't end up being taken until Sunday morning but Leonsky readily recounted it again and once again signed his third confession. General Douglas MacArthur of the US Army was soon informed of Leonsky's arrest and didn't want one of his men tried by the Australian courts. Instead, MacArthur brought in a military commission from the US and as a result, no charges were ever made under Australian law. Instead, Leonsky faced a military tribunal for a crime that violated military law. Many witnesses were called throughout the court-martial, including psychologists, the CIB detectives, US Army officers, the coroner, and various witnesses to the time before the attacks and the aftermath. Through all of this, Eddie Leonsky showed no signs of anger and was often seen taking notes during the proceedings. Fellow soldiers were called to witness their experiences with Private Leonsky. One soldier said that when Leonsky got drunk, his voice changed and he talked more like a girl. And he would talk about poltergeist, werewolves, demons, and other creepy things. They claimed that Leonsky talked to himself a lot. Another witness, Private Gallo, said that not only had Eddie spoken to him about being a kind of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, but he'd also sort of admitted to the murders, and Gallo had encouraged him to own up and plead temporary insanity. The defence used the witness examinations to show that Eddie Leonsky was temporarily insane when under the influence of liquor, and therefore not responsible for his actions. His senior counsel, Lieutenant Ira Rothgerber, told the court of the mental history of Leonsky's family. He also claimed that there were discrepancies in regards to the mud found in Leonsky's tent and on his clothes and that of where Gladys Hosking had died. Eventually, all evidence had been heard from both the prosecution and defence and the court retired to consider its verdict on the 17th of July, 1942. After deliberating for 20 minutes, the court resumed. The chairman of the court martial asked Leonsky to stand and informed him that the court in closed session and upon secret written ballot Three quarters of the members concurring found him guilty of all the charges. Upon secret written second ballot, all the members present, and with all of the members concurring, the court had given its decision on sentencing. Eddie Leonsky found guilty of the murders of Ivy McLeod, Pauline Thompson, 
and Gladys Hawking was sentenced to hang. General MacArthur summarily confirmed the sentence on the 14th of October, and a board of review appointed by MacArthur upheld the findings and sentence later that month. General MacArthur personally signed the order of execution on the 4th of November 1942. The long delay between sentencing and the signing of the order of execution was due to seeking the approval of the court martial sentence from Washington before execution. Leonsky's defense attorney, Ira Rothgerber, attempted to win an external review, and when that was denied, applied to the US Supreme Court. It never amounted to anything, and nothing was overturned. That being said, although Rothgerber was unsuccessful, this case did help to contribute to the development of the Uniform Code of Military Justice, a foundation of military law in the United States. Rothgerber was later court-martialed on MacArthur's mm. orders for insubordination in questioning the Army's handling of the case. During this time, Eddie Leonsky read up on the history of the Kelly Gang. He saw Ned Kelly as a personal hero. On the morning of the 9th of November 1942, Eddie Leonsky was read the warrant of execution and, after praying with two Catholic priests, had two puffs of a cigarette and was led to the gallows at the old Melbourne jail. These gallows, funnily enough, were the same gallows that executed Ned Kelly. The black hood was placed over Eddie Leonsky's head and the lever was pulled. The floor dropped and with an almighty crack, Eddie Leonsky, the brown out strangler, was hanged. An interesting footnote, this was the only occasion in the history of Australia in which a prisoner was executed after being condemned by a foreign court. Edward Leonsky was temporarily interred at several cemeteries in Australia, including Springvale Cemetery. His remains were eventually permanently interred in Schofield Barracks Post Cemetery on the island of Oahu, Hawaii, in a section reserved for prisoners who died in military custody. Thanks for your time today. I really appreciate you watching the whole video. Join me next time as we trawl through another episode in the true crime history of Australia. If you've enjoyed this video, once again, please go ahead and shoot the like button with your trusty boomstick and stab that subscribe button until it bleeds. Make sure you also punch the notification bell in the face so you can get notified every time we release a new video. Stay safe out there.